welcome everybody to our stand-up meeting. This is a, our usual FPGA meeting and uh, for 9th of May, 2023. And what we do is talk about what we've done over the last little bit, a couple of weeks, uh, what we have planned over the next little bit, next week. Uh, if we need any resources and if we've hit any roadblocks. Um, so let's take care of that swiftly. We have uh, a lot of stuff going on in remote labs in terms of the uh, infrastructure and uh, targeted development uh, stations uh, because of what we learned in the, the MATLAB MathWorks class. We were very fortunate to have Robin Getz and a number of other people come in to at the end of the class and, and give us some, some uh, frank assessments of uh, the sort of the roadmap for the system on chips that we're trying to use. And uh, what it looks like is the 9371 board that, that we've been uh, trying to use for a, for a Hyperia is not as successful a chip as uh, analog devices originally wanted. On paper, it's fantastic. That's why we picked it. However, it's uh, the two major areas that it was targeted for were um, base stations for uh, terrestrial and also aerospace, uh, just like we identified it as a, as a really good SOC. Uh, however, it's not been put in any long-term designs. The amount of support that we've gotten from analog devices and that other teams, small and large, uh, have also not gotten is uh, indicative uh, and kind of matches up with the, with the reality. It's, it's not in any long-term designs. And everybody from analog devices to MathWorks to the factory uh, even MathWorks has it as one of their officially supported chips, which is which is interesting. It kind of shows uh, the hope and optimism about this particular design. Um, so what do we do? We don't have infinite resources and you know limited time and limited people. So I'm proposing that we drop the 9371 as the chip for our main designs and we look for something else. Now we do have a 9002. This is also an analog chip. It's got a lot more support. This is the next generation. The 9000 series is, is where they're going. Um, plenty of factory support and lots of designs that use it. The 9001-2 is good, uh, but it does not have JSD 204 b So the 9009 does. So what I'm thinking about doing is proposing that we switch over to the 9009 on the ZC706, which is officially supported. And we keep working with the, uh, on the UltraScale Plus board, because um, the ZC706 is a 7000 series zinc development board. And we would have a 9009 over there instead of the 9371. And on the ZC106, ZCU106, which is UltraScale Plus, uh, which is, uh, Neptune project is our kind of our first uh, team uh, that, that's using it. Yeah. If we want to keep working with the 9002 that's on it, then then we have to do some design constraints um, fixing. We have to, to do some work there because it's not one of the officially supported uh, SOCs. So it's not an officially supported radio uh, from, from Xilinx. So those are the plans. That's the sort of the lay of the land. This also affects Remote Lab South because they have the UltraScale Plus dev board. Um, and I don't believe they have any any radio cards currently, but whatever we pick should probably be reflected there. So we'll go through the inventory. What we can do is uh, sell the things that we're not going to use, um, round up everything, kind of liquidate down, and then use the use those funds to, to towards the purchase of uh, more popular SOCs. And so this decision was not a bad one when it was made at the time, but over the past two years, <laughs> 18 months to two years, it's pretty clear uh, that despite the wonderful brochure of the 9371, it has not gotten traction in the market. And who knows, wide variety of reasons, uh, you know, and we could indeed stick to our guns and keep trying to develop with it. But I have noticed that support, like from the engineer zone, um, support from, from MathWorks has actually been pretty good, uh, but but they've 
they've kind of warned that this is not something that's that's going to be long term supported. Uh, so so that's anyway that's my report on the FPGA uh, for FPGA stand up is that there's uh, we'll make some decisions about it. Uh, I'd like to hear what everybody else has to say, uh, and if there's a third SOC for the radio side that we need to look at, uh, let me know. Uh, I have somebody looking into a Texas Instruments uh, part that would be a, a very big departure from our analog devices mindset so far. Uh, but if it's easy to use, then then that's of huge value. The goal here is to set things up so that people can remote in and develop on some some significantly advanced hardware, you know, so that you can get things that you're not going to be able to buy for yourself, you know, willy nilly. And I think that's pretty much it. The the efforts to get the constraints file under control for the for the different board combination that we have, um, and other people have done this. You can see it all over Engineer Zone. So so we're not doing something uh, completely crazy. Uh, what we we are trying to do is take a existing baseboard from Xilinx and taking and, and moving our radio card to to a more advanced version. A, the one that has more stuff on it, and then making the constraints work. That work is going on right now in the FPGA channel. So if you've done this before or want to help figure it out, because we've gotten some error messages, and you know, uh, I think the in between the you know getting the constraints folded in correctly and then figuring out the clocks, so those are the two big challenges. Um, so if you're if you're experienced in this and want to double check the work then I, uh, I think we'd really appreciate the help. Okay, that's it for me. I think James has uh, should have the floor next so that he can give us any reports about Remote Lab South. Um, uh, nothing too in particular from Remote Lab South, though I will be definitely getting in touch with uh, probably uh, you, Paul, to help do you go through inventory of all of our stuff and see if there's anything that needs to be liquidated as part of this process and determine you know, what, needs to be, what needs to be prioritized, what needs to be sold what needs to be kept all that jazz and we'll see about doing that over the next uh, week or so okay thumbs up yeah thank you james okay in terms of fpga stuff we had a uh, really successful matlab hdl coder that's a toolbox from matlab that turns matlab code and simulant code into hdl code uh, quite readable, um, useful, and uh, ag vendor agnostic, and publishable, as in you could do whatever you want with it, publish it as open source uh, HDL code. So we've already seen on our own uh, evidence that this process does work with lots of asterisks, and we spent four days, uh, two days of theory class and two days of lab practical stuff uh, learning about it. And wow, was it eye-opening. So the people that I've talked to already, um, we, with the acknowledgement that all of this is proprietary tool chains, um, are very impressed with the amount that you can do and how you can control all of these different platforms um, and what we can do with it if we can get our, our hands around it. All right, so, so Lewis, welcome. Uh, Please, uh, do you have the floor and uh, let us know uh, your thoughts, what you've been up to over the past week and what you might want to be doing here and uh, welcome. Oh, sorry, I'm trying to get the uh, unmute. Thank you for um, welcoming me into the group, uh, um, let's see. Let me see if I can get my camera on. I'm actually was driving, so. Anyway, um, I'm an FPGA designer and uh, I have used the ADRV 9009 before uh, with uh, one of these development boards, uh, Xilinx. Uh, so I do have some experience with the ADRV 9009 and especially the uh, analog devices. Um, Sample design that they have, bit uh, with it, uh, the Jesky, uh, uh, and this was for an electronic warfare um, product. But 
that's that's beside the point. Um, so I could contribute in that if if, if I may. Um, and I can also maybe even look at the, um, you know, since I'm an FPGA designer, uh, the constraint issues that I think yeah I saw you had with the errors. Um, but uh, I'm not uh, after this class, which was really good. Thanks for setting it up. Uh, it I'm getting closer to um, being able to do more DSP. Uh, it, it was really just an awesome class. Uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, I do have the master's degree, but that was so, so long ago that I, where I concentrated on DSP. So I do have the theory, but I I've been doing just networking um, for. 15, 20 years. So, so anyway, that's that's my background, and I, what I could actually contribute. Wow, thank you. No, it sounds like you're uh, highly competent, and uh, it's it's wonderful that you have experience with these particular uh, chipsets and and boards, because uh, we're we're trying our dead level best to make it a really good community asset for people. Um, so yes, yeah, so I will write you uh, I, and uh, let I you do know. Own, I do own, I do own the ADRB nine thousand nine development board as well. Oh, cool. Okay. Very good. Yeah, it sounds it sounds like that might be, might be a good thing for us to go ahead and move in that direction for for a lot of different reasons. So, thank you. Um, and yeah, it would help to have. Uh, someone look over the process of trying to make the constraints work out. Uh, the consensus from those of us that that have some FPGA designer experience with these systems is that all the, that, that you really just need to have the correct constraints and then the ZCU 106 will work. Uh, you know, getting it to go from the ZCU 102 to the 106 to support um, the 9002 should be relatively straightforward. Um, it's relatively straightforward if you if you know how to do it. <laughs> or once you've done it, then it looks easy. And right now I'm like, these are weird errors. Um, you know, so I'm suspecting it's probably clock related. And because I didn't touch any of the clock setup, but you know, I mean my instinct from you know from doing this from a long time ago that that, that needs probably a little more attention. So thank you. It would be super helpful and deeply appreciated. And yeah, go DSP Power. Uh, great, great stuff. And thank you very much for the feedback on the class. Uh, it was uh, a whole lot of stuff to cover. It was four of the MATLAB classes combined into one. Uh, so we we hashed through for, for several weeks to try to figure out the content. And we didn't actually get around to the Cordic stuff. So we were supposed to have a, a segment on Cordic that we didn't quite get to. Um, but that was pretty much the only um, casualty of the of the schedule. And I'm, I'm really hoping to do something similar uh, with Amaranth, the, the Python-based uh, HDL um, tool. So it's roughly in the same category as HDL Coder, where you take Python code and make HDL. Um, and whatever we learn from from using HDL Coder, we, we would like to provide and, and communicate to any open source teams that are working in the tools area. The open source tools are are significantly behind uh, the the commercial and proprietary offerings. So uh, any anything that we can see in terms of functionality that that could be communicated back to the teams working on open source options, that's one of the things that that we do. Yeah, and thank you and welcome. Is, is there anything that you need or any questions that you have or access that you would like uh, over the next week? Uh, well, I'm just starting. So I uh, I did see that there was a Git repository. So I need to get started with that just to pull it in and see what you have and uh, maybe even duplicate that error that you, you're encountering. Okay, yeah, that's all. I put it on Slack and we're gonna start up a, a project repo for Neptune today, um, and we're we now have uh, the green light from the the authors of the spec for Neptune, which is what all of this platform is is kind of devoted towards uh, towards serving as the first project. Uh, so, yeah. So if all goes well, um, knock on wood and all, then then all of that should be 
uh, accessible later today. And yeah, there's a lot of repos. <laughs> so there's a variety of things done. Um, and we, we try very hard to make sure that there's at least a good readme. Um, but yeah, any questions that you have or anything when you're looking at this and you're like, wow, it could be easier if I had this or that, then just let me know and we'll do our best to, to get it to happen. Cool, okay. All right, Sasha, you have the floor. Sasha said she had no microphone. Oh, okay. Thank you. Oh, dear. All right. Thank you, Sasha. Sasha was at our class, too. And uh, just let me know if there's anything that uh, was uh, good or bad. Uh, good feedback. Oh, good. I'm glad. Yeah, I learned a ton. And the, the Q&A at the end was super useful. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sasha. And I think you probably you were the one that first flagged the 9000 series as better than what we were looking at. Uh, so credit credit to that. That was a, a very good suggestion. Um, you know, picking picking the right parts is very important. Component engineering is a big deal of what we do. Okay, that's uh, so that's that's what I've got now. And thank you very much, Jay, for for coming here. Uh, I think we're going to talk for a little bit about. Uh, a really neat CubeSat design, uh, or and also anything else that Jay wants to talk about. So I'm going to turn the floor over to Jay, and you can share a screen if you want to, because um, I think we have access to the to the repo from the from the design that we're we're looking at leveraging in order to get uh, cool things done um, with not just Laura, uh, but also Ribbit and and any of our other uh, protocols that we're that we're working with. Uh, so I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Okay, thanks. Can you hear me all right? Okay. Uh, I'm not going to screen share. I'll just point people at Slack because I'm, I'm talking to my phone. <laughs> uh, all right. So um, yeah. So I guess the the impetus came from uh, from Michelle because she mentioned that we might have an opportunity for. I'm trying to find it. I think there was a a sun synchronous orbit uh, launch sometime in late. This year, next year, next year. Yes. If we had if we had hardware that we could fly, then that might be a launch opportunity for us. And uh, I think that uh, in talking on the Ribbit channel, it was Pierre brought up the idea of uh, maybe what we should have is a uh, an ORI ongoing project that actually completes some. CubeSats or have a small CubeSat uh, one you reference design so that when opportunities like this pop up, we're ready with hardware and say, oh yeah, we've got we've got this hardware, we're we have an experiment, we're gonna run on it, let's go. Um, and one of the up one of the options was looking at uh, some open source satellite CubeSats designs that are already out there because why reinvent things if you can pick a, pick an open source satellite that's already been to space. And uh, the BIRDS program from, and I don't know how to pronounce it, Q-Tech, uh, very University. Um, they, if, if anyone goes over to the Ribbit channel on Slack, you can see the last couple of messages and then scroll up a little bit, you'll see that there's a birdsproject.com website and, uh, and then their GitHub repo. So Pierre brought up them as a possibility. Um, and I dug into them a little bit and uh, like both the last launches that they had, they had three identical satellites and it seems like none of the three actually worked uh, once they were deployed. So uh, I think they had success before that. And so there's you know, questions of, is there something wrong with the design? Is there something that they are improving on? You know, if we wanna use them as leverage, I guess there's multiple questions. First of all, does ORI want to do a, a one you reference satellite and set up a group, a working group to kind of work on that? And then what would be that, if you're going to go a, an open source satellite route, or is there a reference design you should use? Um, and Birds X is possibly one of them. Um, and you know what kind of other technology should we be leveraging there? Um, so uh, 
And I'm kind of, I, my background on this is because I've been trying to work on the SpriteSat stuff and trying to get a, a small LoRa experiment up on a sounding rocket. Um, and so you know, but there's a little bit of overlap there and, and what I was already pursuing and, and but I, I just, maybe not a little overlap. There's, there's a little overlap, but this is a much bigger project. So obviously it's not a, it's definitely a team effort project level. So um, I think I think that's it. Uh, um, I think the only other thing I had had really to do with Laura stuff that it looked like there was recently some, I suspect there was an undergrad project where they're looking at, uh, let's see, what school was it? I don't remember what school it was. Um, over in the Sprite Sat channel, if you look, one of the last messages I posted a couple of things about some folks that wanted to do Laura moon bounce, um, which has been done before. But what was interesting with this group is that they were using somewhat smaller equipment, and they were also using um, SDR Angel with a plugin that has a it's called Chirp Sat, uh, Chirp Chat, which is sort of Laura. I guess you can decode Laura in certain with certain parameters. Because if, if folks don't know, Laura is proprietary, and they haven't um, Semtech hasn't released all the details on it. It's been reverse engineering, uh, so it would be interesting if if Chirp Chat was a, a way to explore Laura mod Laura type modulation, but in open source ways. So that's there, that's posted over there. Um, I guess I would open up to the group to see if there's any interest or comments or whatever. So I'm going to go mute. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. I think you summarized it so very well. And yeah, all of these threads really kind of pull together towards what might be a really nice opportunity. So I, I the opportunity for, for CubeSats is really pretty interesting. It's a lot of space um, on a somewhat risky launch. Um, and it was described to me as free. It's, it's I mean, we'd have to pay for whatever it costs to to comply with the the requirements and and um and the launchers and all but it's a it's a really nice opportunity um and and so i have i do have some additional information back from from the the people offering it uh and i've i've, I've asked for clarification like can i share all of what you've told me <laughs> just to make absolutely sure that it's that it's okay to talk about so as soon as I get that okay, then I'll I'll post it and, and share it to everybody. Um, so it, so it is a real offer. Uh, it'd be a lot of work on our part. So I I think yeah we would like to do a design, and looking hard at the reference design, you know, from birds is good. Uh, Pierre couldn't be here today. The for he's the project lead for Ribbit, um, but he wanted to very enthusiastically endorse uh, a way forward to try to get space uh, in, any anything in space he's, he's excited about uh, and and if he could answer any questions at least from the ribbit side of it um, and yeah the chirp sat is is cool looking I, I looked at that and I was kind of I'm really happy to see things like that and it is true that uh, that Laura has some proprietary uh, blobs in it and and it is also true that it's been reverse engineered one of the very best presentations um you know about reverse engineering is one of the the folks uh in the open source community walking through uh, uh this is how i reverse engineered laura with all of the techniques ranging from you know using the fcc id to figure out the basics to uh brute forcing to uh you know uh, and, and all the tools that, that he used. Uh, so so I'll post a, a link to that. It's on a video on YouTube. It's, a, it's quite good. And he also talks about the IP concerns, uh, intellectual property concerns about, you know, why is it, you know, what does it mean to be proprietary? Um, you know, and once you reverse engineer it, can you really then just go ahead and publish your own version? And the answer is it depends because of a lot of different reasons. So this is a very interesting part of digital communications. And um, yeah, I think that we should, should move forward uh, as best we can to try to take advantage of the of the resources that, that we have. And you know, we, we do have some some funding left from the uh, 
uh, Ambisat respin project, and and we can at least get get a solid uh, whack at it uh, if we have to build something, which I'm sure we do. So I think my answer is is yes, and and we can reach out and start trying to to figure out if there's anybody that would like to to work on this so that we can add enough enough people. I think that's going to be our biggest challenge is finding enough people to uh, devote the time to to do all of the stuff that needs to happen. All right, that's that's my opinion. Uh, anybody else have anything to say about this? Okay, more soon, because uh, it's exciting to get a, a launch offer. I did make the rounds of all of the people that I talk to routinely about launches, and I got a variety of very interesting answers, um, ranging from uh, groups that can't do anything because they don't have enough people, uh, that it's a human resources constraint, uh, not enough folks in their, in their group, to uh, organizations that have turned down free launches because they already have enough. They have enough free launches already to get their stuff in orbit. Um, and so it's been a very interesting experience to take this offer around to all of the people that we uh, routinely work with and to see the the variety of responses. So hopefully we can we can be one of the ones that that are included in a in a nice offer like this. Michelle, I had a question on this and I, I don't if, if you can't answer it at this point, um, we can wait. I don't remember if you said who it was, but who was providing the launch opportunity, but it sounded like it was a launch opportunity on a an experimental, maybe a non-flight proven vehicle. So we're kind of running as ballast and that's why it's technically free. Is yeah, that I would, I would say? I think that's fair to say that it's in that category, but it's not a newcomer. It's a, it's someone that's, that's done flights before. Um, okay. So, so it's not a complete newbie. It's uh, it's folks that have had some amount of success, but that it is definitely the hey, do you want to do you want to put you know, <laughs> hey, you want to yeah. help? <laughs> want want to ride? You know, <laughs> want to see how high you can get? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it might yeah. it might work. You know, you, we you never know, and yeah. you know, as long as it it doesn't cut too deep in terms of uh, uh, you know, I mean, could, would we would we put all of our chips? shove them all forward on the table for this one thing. Nah, I don't think we would, but I think we can afford to build something that can, can get put on uh, yeah. depending on volunteers and people. So yeah, as soon as I'm told what I can say, you know, I just wanted to make sure um, when people send me emails full of information, I tend to assume that I can actually publish it, but that, that needs, you need to be a little careful when it comes to space and, and commercial folks that, uh, that, that may think that you're assuming the opposite, that you would not, you know, just post it uh, to a giant list of people. So sure. yeah, as, as soon as I, as I can say, as much as I can say, I'll say it. Great. And Thanks. we'll also keep looking for other opportunities too. Um, we can always just buy one, uh, but that's a whole lot of money. And that means mm -hmm. uh, a big burden for, for fundraising. Um, and we already got a pretty big, big load of fundraising. So that's the, you know, we'll keep, keep looking for, for all sorts of other opportunities like this. And, you know, the more that we interact with different organizations and companies and, and the more service and, and designs we publish, then the more often this will happen. And it's, uh, that's how it's progressing. So it's good news. We'll just keep at it. Great. Okay, Paul, uh, I know that you're, you're on travel, uh, but you have been very busy. Uh, according to our GitHub operations channel, which is reporting all of your publishing. Uh, so if you'd like to talk a little bit about that, it'd be great to hear. Okay. Yeah, I'm on the family health thing going on for an indeterminate amount of time. So I've been away from the remote lab, but not ignoring it. I've been using it. I've been doing, doing some remote software development on a virtual machine uh, toward getting Opulent Voice uh, more fully fleshed out. We have had a demo DEF CON most of a year ago now, where we were able to push voice through uh, on a very basic protocol free <laughs> channel. And uh, since then, the goal has been to integrate it into more, a more full fleshed out protocol stack using standards. So we could 
actually expect, expect to interoperate with some existing Opus supporting programs. Um, and that's coming along now. We're able to do the demo again at the new data rate with the new uh, overhead levels and so forth. Um, not fully fleshed out protocol stacks. You have a lot of it still dummied out, but I can transmit and receive. And we found some of the performance problems that we had at the DEF CON demo and fixed them with a lot of very valuable help from Michelle. And um, so we're back to a, a point where we can start making progress again, that people trying to use it for a rocket launch should be able to pick up the new version now and start using it if they choose to take that step. Um, there's more work to be done, of course. I, I want it, I want to implement a full uh, embedded solution eventually so that you could transmit, receive, use it like a radio, push to talk and data as well as voice, and all that stuff. The infrastructure for that is in place to some extent and the path forward is reasonably clear. Just amount of work to do on, on doing it. Um, nothing else to say about the remote lab, I think. On the question of what radio to use, it seems like it would be advantageous in some ways to step, take a step back and think about using the 9360 one because the Pluto is so readily available and relatively cheap. The remote lab is great and all, but there's no substitute for having the hardware in front of you. Like people can probably afford a Pluto fairly relatively or relatively easily. Um, of course, the Pluto is not all you need. Having some test equipment is also helpful and the, the, even just the cables and the connectors and stuff add up, but still, if we think it would be within the capabilities of the 9361 to do our project, I would consider that to be a front runner just on the availability basis. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up because it came up in the Q&A at the end of the class. Um, and we used the 9361 SOM, not the Pluto, but the de but the expanded dev board. There's a smallish dev board that they have, but that's what we used in the lab examples uh, for the last two days, for Thursday and Friday of the class. And so the interesting thing about the 9361, it was a huge hit and very popular. It's in a lot of very long lived, long term designs today. The process used on the 9361 was not continued. In the middle of COVID, the factories all kind of waved off the process, the silicon process. So there isn't a whole lot of future from a factory perspective for this part. Now that doesn't really matter as much, you know, because there's a lot of them out there still and and all, and there are still existing or what they said. Oh, so well, I think some people are making them still. Um, and so that was that was something that kind of caught my attention. Um, also the FPGA on the 9361, it's a 7010. So it's, it's a zinc and it's a little on the small side. What we found uh, from Everest's work on the Pluto is that you could have the transmitter, you could put our transmitter intellectual property in there, but you couldn't get a, like a, a good, you couldn't get the polyphase filter bank for the receive side in there at the same time. So you had a trouble routing it. And so that, so that's the Pluto though. If you took, the, so it has nothing to do with the 9361. If you took the 9361 and took the, it's essentially an open source design for the Pluto SDR. And then we decided to upgrade the zinc, then I think that that would be a good, a good way forward. But we'd have to do all of that to get a board to fit our design in. Now we could do all of this in simulation, um, which <laughs> I gotta tell you is kind of very tempting to do because my bias is like, if it doesn't really work until it's over the air, like until you're transmitting over the air. That's the, that means it works. You test over the air as quickly as possible, which means you have to actually have hardware either strung together or duct taped together or some, you know, something that you bought and, and connected together. Um, in order to get there for the 9361, we have to go back out and look at what we can buy. Cause the, the Pluto, which is so incredibly inexpensive has a relatively small FPGA. So, we it's could also, do it's already an uh, open source project called the Pluto Plus. It's yeah. Pluto design. I think they put a bigger FPGA in there. I'm not certain about that part. They yeah. relax some of the other 
constraints that the Pluto imposes. I'll go back so, and look at that. The last time that I looked at it, it was um, it was a database, like a design, but then there, but they were looking to fund it and not not getting enough money, and then the supply chain problems, which we hope are evaporating. We hope it's getting better. So I'll go back and see if that's uh, if that's moving forward or still active. I thought because the Pluto Plus is a is is an independent project, right? That's not an analog devices project, or is it? That's my understanding. Is an independent device. Okay. Analog devices for for a while there was talking about a follow on to the to the Pluto. They were talking about like, and there was some work on it. the The people that were working on it at analog devices appear to be at different companies now, though. So I'm not really sure yeah. what the status of that is. So, well, yeah. Probably like the Pluto for the 9002 eventually. But. Yeah. Well, the 9002 does not have JSD, so that's a that's a that's a big thing. Um, it just has CMOS or LVDS as the as the interface. And the 9009 does have have a, as JSD 204 B or C. So. It's another consideration is that if we can if we can get it all to be in a modern uh, interface for for serial communications, then then that would be a big win, and we wouldn't have to have a sort of a configuration management complexity problem for for working on it. But yeah, you're right. The ninety three sixty one is a juggernaut. It's in a lot of designs, and there's a lot of uh, work out there. You know, not just from people that we know like Ever East, but but uh, a whole landscape of of work that you can draw on, and that's uh, that's non-trivial <laughs> factor in its favor. So thank you for for bringing that up. Um, yeah, let's let's try to summarize this and present it on the list and and get some feedback and try to come to a decision quickly so that we can. And both and is is good. Uh, that's both and is just as good or better than than either or you know we don't have to pick just one um but if we pick them all then i think <laughs> it's <laughs> as good as not picking any yeah exactly that uh, too many would make the the remote labs job uh management job extremely difficult um you know even even picking things from the same family like sticking with xilinx and analog devices these boards and these socs are different enough uh, to where it is a chore to context switch and context switching as we all know is expensive uh, to your to your energy level and brain so my goal is to make this as easy as possible for everybody including us we will be picking up uh, a new person for on the FPGA side um, so we got somebody joining our team in early June that uh, can work uh, full-time and that's that's nice. Um, and uh, we got a, a good amount of feedback from from one of our recent presentations here here locally. Uh, so some some FPGA designers and some people that work at NXP that are very interested in what we're doing, and and we may may get some additional uh, people there. Uh, so we'll just keep doing what we're doing and keep publishing and and uh, trying to improve our processes and communications and and keep moving forward. OK, any last uh, requests uh, for resources or any problems that you're having or, or anything that we need to talk about today? Uh, you all have the floor. All right. Thank you, everybody, so much for taking the time out. Uh, we'll we'll meet again uh, next week, and if I can put together like an office hours or open session later this week, I will. Uh, and Paul, if you if you're able to host one from from where you are, uh, feel free to do so. All right. See you on Slack and on the list. And thank you very much for for all of the time and effort. It's deeply appreciated.